All right, let's uh let's go ahead and pray, and then we will get uh to some to some serious business here. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Um, man, um, it's so amazing to see uh, all the things, Lord, that you've laid out for us to know, to give us hope, to give us peace, so that we would have knowledge, true, comprehensive, thorough knowledge of how to examine the world around us, how to look at it, how to perceive it. It is Indeed, your book indeed is the book of reality. We pray, God, that this would be an instructive time, an encouraging time, Lord, and that we would learn much uh, with this uh, brief time we have together and that overall you would be glorified. Um, we thank you so much, Lord, for it's in your son's name. Amen. All right, so um, we are in, in the thick of Revelation chapter 13. And so let's just go ahead and jump right into it. We've been asking, um, instead of just going through and um, just kind of looking at the verses and kind of trying to understand and piece together what they mean, we've uh, kind of separated um, or look or not separated, but looked at, or looking at the chapters. I'm like echoing. Wow. <laughs> um, we're asking some questions about this particular chapter. The first one is who or what is the beast of the earth, right? We will take a look at that a little bit later on um, in subsequent teachings. How is the perseverance of the saints meant to be understood in this passage? I think we all have a general idea of what it is, but... As I mentioned last week, there is a particular tradition that teaches that if you don't persevere to the end, um, whether it be affliction that you uh, experience or persecution, um, it's possible you're not saved. And they use this as well as other verses to make their point. Is that is that true? And what is or who is the mark of the beast? Right. Um, these are the three questions, the three main questions we will be kind of looking at and observing in this particular uh, this particular chapter here. Um, we talked about some of the images that we're seeing. Um, this kind of helps us anchor ourselves to the text itself. Okay, so we see some of the images that John has detailed within Revelation 13. We the dragon. That is the, the 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 red dragon from chapter twelve is mentioned. We don't again. We don't have to uh, pontificate or speculate who that is. This is Satan, right? We are we are told this in Revelation chapter twelve, verse nine, right? Um, we have the beast of the sea, which is mentioned here in this text, and um, we talked about him last week, and that underscores the conqueror. The conqueror in um, Revelation 6, who is known as the beast in Revelation chapter 11. And then we have the beast of the earth, which we will get to here in short order in the next several weeks. Who is he and what role or part does he play in all this? So the first portion of Revelation 13, again, has to do with the origin and the nature of the conqueror, um, as a matter of fact. We talked about his origin and his influence, that the influence that he has does not originate or come from him. It comes from Satan. He gives his authority to this beast. As a matter of fact, we read that uh, in Revelation 13 that the beast is part of a beast that is many kings, many people in authority. And he happens to just excel uh, all of those. We see that his nature and his attitude is destructive and rebellious. The images that we see, uh, uh, the, the leopard, the lion, the bear, all of those uh, kind of referent in the Old Testament, those that are destructive and rebellious, they're kind of wild, living on instinct. So his attitude is that as well. His counterfeit works we see uh, within 
Revelation last week, a, a death um, or a fatal wound and a resurrection of sorts. So much so that it amazes individuals who are taken by this individual. They don't have to believe this, but because of the sights and the sounds and the uh, observation of this, they wholeheartedly fall and worship. Proskaneo is the word here. They worship this individual, this figure. But it's all a ruse. It does. It's not real. Let's continue uh, in verses four and following. We looked at verses uh, one to three last week. So let's continue to look at this. It says they worship the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast and they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast who is able to wage war with him? A mouth was given to him speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and to act. 42 months was given him, and he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Um, we already looked at the ten horns and the seven heads. We've observed this detail before, right? The seven heads and the ten horns represent uh, this particular kingdom and this influence. So we've already observed these things. John continues to describe how the world responds to this beast, observing him as a Messiah figure, in quotes. We mentioned this earlier um, in previous teachings, that this is a false messianic kingdom. God has not sanctioned this, okay? He has his anointed one, and his anointed one is coming soon, in short order. But this is a false kingdom, that has been set up, that God has not uh, uh, sanctioned this kingdom. We see a comment concerning their beast, the beast's power and strength that is uh, found in verse four. So they worship the beast, they fall down before him and they say, who is like the beast? And who is able to wage war with him? A supposed rhetorical question that no one can conquer this, this individual. No one can conquer this man. No one can conquer this beast. He had a mouth that spoke uh, great or big things. Megas is the word here. Arrogant, boastful words, right? Talk about that in a minute. The quality of the words, along with the character of who this individual is, underscores extreme hubris of this individual. So it's not just it's 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 the character, and out of this character comes these arrogant, boastful words. Matter of fact, these words are so boastful that he speaks against all deities, but even God himself. We see this in verse six. And he opened up his mouth in blasphemy, slanders, destructive words against God, right? To blaspheme his name or his reputation. Let's turn to Daniel seven to kind of underscore this point. As I mentioned, Daniel, Daniel, the book of Daniel parallels this chapter very nicely in several places. I will start at verse 6. It says, while I was watching, another beast appeared. It was like a leopard with four wings of a bird and on its back it had four heads and was given authority to rule. Verse seven, while I was night, while I was watching in the night visions, a fourth beast appeared frightening and dreadful and incredibly strong with large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and it trampled with its feet whatever was left. But it was different from all the beasts before it and it had 10 horns. We 
Again, we talked about that last week. While I was considering the horns or thinking about them, suddenly another horn, a little one, a small one, came up among them. And the three of the first horns were uprooted before it. There were eyes in this horn like a man's, and it had a mouth that spoke arrogantly. Jump down to verse 11. As I watched then, because of the sound of the arrogant words, the horn was speaking. As I continued watching, the beast was killed and its body was destroyed and given over to burning fire. Jump down to verse 19. After this vision, Daniel says, I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast. And the one different from all the others, extremely terrifying with iron teeth and bronze claws, devouring, crushing, and trampling with his feet, whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on his head and about the other horn that came up before which three fell. The horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully or arrogantly and was more visible than the others. So we see Daniel here speaks of this horn that had eyes like a man and speaks arrogantly, boastfully about himself, about his rule, about his power, about his influence. Jump down to, let's go to Daniel chapter 11. We get a little bit more clarity from the messenger who speaks to Daniel. We've are, again, we've already went through Daniel chapter 11. So we have, so we've laid down the foundation, we've laid down the groundwork, and now we'll talk about this individual here in Daniel chapter 11. It says, he will not show regard for the God of his fathers. Um, the God, um, he will not show regard for the God of his fathers, the God longed for by women, or for any other God, because he will magnify himself above all. And then if we continue to read on, he will also uh, honor what uh, the messenger to Daniel calls a God of fortresses, right? So he will think very highly of himself. Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Verse four. I'll start at verse three. It says, let no one in any way deceive you. For it that is, it will not come or it, that's not in the text, but. The reference is the day of the Lord here for for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he sits in the sanctuary publicizing that he himself is God or displaying himself as being God, this, this person is so proud, so arrogant that he claims that he himself is God himself in human flesh. This great red, and, and one of the reasons for this arrogant boasting is because the red dragon, that is Satan, has given the the authority of the spirit of the age to this beast. You don't have to turn here. Um, I will. Uh, we're going to go back to Daniel, chapter seven. Again, while I was watching, another beast appeared, and it was like a leopard with four wings of a bird, and on its back its four heads, and was given authority to rule. While I was watching in the night visions, a fourth beast appeared, frightening and dreadful and incredibly strong, with large iron teeth that devoured and crushed, and it trampled with its feet whatever was left. It was different 
from all the beasts before, and it had ten horns. Okay. Again, while I was considering the horn, suddenly another horn, a little one, came up among them, and the three of these horns were uprooted before it. They were, they were, they were uprooted. They were taken out. And there were eyes in this horns like a man's, and it had a mouth that spoke arrogantly. The reason these three horns were uprooted and taken out by the small little horn with eyes like a man and spoke, because again, the influence that he had does not come from him. It comes from somewhere else. Daniel chapter 11. We already read this, but instead we will, we will continue here. He will not show regard for his fathers, the God longed for by women or for any other God, except he will magnify himself above all. Instead, he will honor a God of fortresses, a God his fathers did not know with gold, silver, precious stones, and riches. He will deal with the strongest forces with the help of a foreign God. He will take down kings. Same thing here in Daniel 7 as well. These three individuals are uprooted because he will deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign God, a God whom his fathers did not know. He will greatly honor those who acknowledge him, making them rulers over many and distributing parcels as rewards. So because of this, this influence, this great, huge influence that this individual, this beast has, he will be given authority to act or to wreck havoc, create chaos, destroy individuals for 42 months. That's, that's a pretty specific period of time, right? And uh, from the perception of those who are in there, uh, in this particular situation, I would presume that that would feel like an eternity. 42 months. This phrase we've seen before, as a matter of fact, 42 months, if you, rem if you remember and are keeping track of uh, these, these specific numbers, we've seen this number in Revelation chapter 11. A couple of chapters over. Concerning the two witnesses, let's look here. Revelation chapter 11. I'll start at verse 1. Then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. This time, this period of time, that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 11 seems to parallel the time that the authority, that, that, that the beast will have authority, which makes sense because he has to invade, go into the temple and claim himself to be God, right? That would make sense. We also see that this is around the time of the two witnesses also. The result of his arrogance, that is his boastfulness, because of the influence that he's received from this foreign deity, because he honors this deity with gold and silver and all that, and this deity seems to give him uh, uh, immense influence. Because of his arrogance, he speaks injurious slander against uh, slanderous words against God's reputation or his name, and his tabernacle. He smears God's name. He smears his reputation. He speaks arrogantly against him. And consequently, those who fall and worship him worship the, uh, the dragon who gave his authority to the beast. Very similar here, where God, again, the Father, gives his authority to, to his son. We we acknowledge the Son, and in turn that glorifies the Father because the Son sent, or the Father sent him. In a very twisted, perverted way, 
Satan gives authority to the beast. Everyone who acknowledges and worships the beast acknowledges the dragon. The result of his arrogance, he speaks injurious slanders against God's reputation and his tabernacle. Now, this is an interesting sentence here. He opened up his mouth and speaks blasphemies. This is verse 6 of chapter 13. To, um, and blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. That is those who dwell in heaven. Well, if you look at your text here, I know mine is the NASB 95. That that is is in italics. That means that that's not in the text. The translators are trying to offer some clarity on this on this particular verse. Um, but let's take a look at it and see um, what it what it. I'm going to offer an alternative. So skenin is, is, the, is the Greek word here for tabernacle, found in verse 6. It comes from two words, skeos and skia. You put them together, this is what you got. Literally translated, it is a shadow vessel or object, an, uh, an object or a vessel that casts a shadow over a person. Right? Think of like shade, you know. Um, things like that. Um, when these two words placed together, they highlight a habitation, a tent of some kind, uh, a booth um, where they make, if you go uh, to, the, to the Feast of Tabernacles, you see these booths all over the place, right, um, that are made with, uh, with wood and, uh, and palm branches. Okay. That's kind of the idea here. A tabernacle, a vessel or an object. This phrase, uh, skenin, uh, occurs in the book of Hebrews 10 times, okay? and the word occurs 20 times in the New Testament, all over the place, but it's found in the book of Hebrews 10 times. Whenever uh, you see this word, it, it could be used in many different ways. Um, it could be used to refer to uh, individuals who have a booth or a tabernacle over them. It could be uh, established as a place of honor. Okay. We'll talk about that in a little bit. It could be used for false deities in their worship, which we'll see in a little bit. And it refers to God's habitation or dwelling. Okay. Let's take a look at some usages of this word here. Uh, in Matthew chapter 17, verse 4. This is uh, during the transfiguration when Jesus is transfigured uh, before uh, Peter um, and John. It says here, um, it says even his clothes, I'll start at verse three. It says even his clothes became white as the light. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared with them talking with him. So uh, he takes Peter, James and John up to this mountain and transfigures before them, showing him his glory. And then, uh, seemingly out of nowhere, Moses and Elijah show up, right? Peter, um, possibly not knowing what to do with this particular event, right, uh, says to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Uh, if you want, I will make three skinning tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. Moses being um, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the conduit of the law. Elijah being a great prophet and the one who was to return to announce the proclamation of the kingdom. Okay? So we have three tabernacles here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elisha. Okay? In Acts... Chapter 7, verses 39 and following. We see an interesting uh, a statement of how it's used here. It says, our ancestors uh, were unwilling to obey him, but pushed him away and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. This is Stephen recounting the history of Israel. As for, as for this Moses who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what's happened to him. 
They even made a calf in those days, offered sacrifice to the idol, and they were celebrating with their hands uh, what their hands had made. Then God turned away and gave them up to worship the host of heaven as it is written in the book of the prophets. House of Israel, did you bring me offerings and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness? Verse 33. No, you took up the tent of Molech, or Moloch rather, and the star of your God, Rephan the images that you made to worship. So now I will deport you beyond Babylon. That word again, tent is skinin. You took up the dwelling of Molech. You, you established uh, his sanctuary, essentially. And, all, and, you, and of course, when you establish one sanctuary, you take all of the customs and uh, uh, practices that go along with that, right? You believe this God, and so you set up his dwelling among you guys when you weren't supposed to. And as a result, you got destroyed. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. We read, uh, but the Messiah has appeared, high priest of the good things that have come, in, in a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is, not of this creation. Jesus, being the great high priest, went to not a copy of the tabernacle, but the actual tabernacle, right? And offered himself. So when it comes to this particular word, skinin, <clears throat> it mostly refers to a physical dwelling, a physical dwelling place. Okay? It can be made by men in the case of uh, Matthew 17, suggesting that they make them three booths or tabernacles for them, or it can be a place not made with hands. This is how I kind of translated uh, uh Revelation chapter 13, verse 6. And I'll give you the reasoning why. It says, And he opened up his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and those who dwell in his tabernacle. The people are not the tabernacle. There is no occurrence where the saints are referred to as the tent or they're referred to as the tabernacle. It's not there. And just to underscore, it is consistent, this, that is this, this particular translation I have up here, it is consistent with all of the other scriptures that use this particular word. There is never one time in the text where skinin is referred to as a people or persons, but it's always a physical dwelling place, always. So the object here is that the beast is slandering God and the saints, the saints who dwell there, or those who dwell in his tabernacle. This could also be, this could also include angelic hosts. This could also include, uh, this includes God himself, those who, those who acknowledge him. Again, this speaks to the hubris. And the um, and and just the sheer destruction and 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 just destructive nature of this individual. We continue to read uh, the, of this individual's attitude here. Following, it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All who live on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not written since the foundation of the world in the book of life who has been slaughtered. So now we see the, the, the smearing of, 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 of those in the heavens, right? That he has no respect, kind of almost like how the prince of the power of the air has no regard for uh, those who are uh, for God who is an authority in heaven either. Now he's going to turn his attention to those who are on the earth. John writes that the beast was given influence 
and authority over every person. Verse 7 of chapter 13. And he also details that he will make war, palemos, we've seen this word before, with the saints, and he will overcome them. So uh, it means exactly that. He will overcome the saints. They will be treaded underfoot. Again, we see this quality also found in the Old Testament. Back to Daniel chapter 7. While I was watching in the night visions, a fourth beast appeared, frightening and dreadful and incredibly strong, with large iron teeth that devoured and crushed and trampled with his feet whatever was left. It was different from all the beasts before it, and it had ten horns. While considering the horns, another horn, a little one came up among them. The three of the horns were uprooted before it. There were eyes in this horn like a man's, and it had a mouth that spoke arrogantly. Jump down to verse 19. Then I wanted to know the meaning of the fourth beast, the one who was different from all the others, extremely terrifying with iron teeth and bronze claws, devouring, crushing, trampling with its feet, whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and, the, and about the other horn that came up before which three fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke arrogantly and that was more visible than the others as I was watching this horn waged war against the holy ones and was prevailing over them. Daniel chapter 8, verse 9. From one of them, a little horn emerged and grew extensively toward the south and the east and towards the beautiful land. It grew as high as the heavenly host and made some of the stars and some of the hosts fall to the earth, and only fall, but trampled them also. It made itself great, even up to the prince of the host. It removed his daily sacrifice and overthrew the place of his sanctuary. Because of rebellion, a host together with the daily sacrifice will be given over. The horn will throw truth to the ground. And it will be successful in whatever it does. Tooth and claw, it will, it will, he will, he will just totally decimate those in his wake. Verse 13. Then I heard one speaking, and another holy one said to the speaker, How long will these events last? The daily sacrifice, the rebellion that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary of the host to be trampled. He said, for 23, 2300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be restored. So he will, he will rise, he will speak arrogantly, and he will crush everything in his wake. No wonder he's so confident. The people who worship him, they are confident that he is indeed the conqueror of all conquerors. He is the one that's just, he crushes everything in his way. Who can stop him? Who can stop this man? Jesus picks up on this too in Matthew 24 as well. Verses 15 and following. He tells the disciples ahead of time, not that he's telling them anything new. He is, uh, he is uh, uh, rewinding, the, rewinding all this stuff back and piecing it together for them. So when you see the abomination that causes desolation, the abomination of desolation, the destruction spoken by the prophet Daniel, which we just looked at, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Don't stop. Don't, don't, don't try to don't try to stand up to his army. Don't try to stand up to him. Don't try to just just go. A man on the housetop must not come down to get the things out of his house. Oh man, I forgot. Man, I forgot my car keys. No, go. Leave. Right? A man in the field must not go back to get his clothes. 
Just leave with what you got on. Don't even pack your stuff. Eh? Woe to pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. A lament from Jesus himself during this time for those women who are pregnant and nursing moms. It's going to be tough. Pray that your escape, your escape may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For at that time, there will be great affliction. He will just come in and just destroy everything. He'll destroy. If you're, if you're there, he's not, he's not going to bat an eyelash with you. The kind that has not taken place from the beginning of the world until now and never will again. Unless those days were cut short or limited, no one would survive. That's talking about him. His rule. I mean, he's just, just destroying everything. But those days will be limited because of the elect, whom is Israel. If anyone tells you then, look, there's the Messiah over there. Do not believe it. Why is Jesus talking like this? Because there's a Messiah that's coming that isn't sanctioned by him. That's the point. False messiahs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So don't think that you... Um, Israel are going to avoid this. I'm telling you this ahead of time so that you know what's coming. John writes that the beast was given influence and authority over every person. And we see that this quality again is found in the New Testament. This contrast with the saints in Revelation 13 is made to what's known as the land dwellers. That's the word in the Greek there. The land dwellers, those who dwell on the land. Okay? Or those who dwell upon the land. Remember, if you remember this, we've seen this phrase before. This is a, uh, this, you've seen this phrase. This phrase refers to a particular type of person. We are talking about unbelievers here. We saw this in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. This is used there when it's uh, referring, uh, when Jesus is addressing uh, one of the seven churches. We saw this word in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10. That is those who dwell on the earth. That is the phrase there. And Revelation chapter 11, verse 10. When it talks about uh, how when they kill, when uh, the beast kills the two witnesses and destroys them and the world celebrates and sends each other's gifts, you know, they call Amazon and, and give each other's gifts and things like that. Okay. Those, these are the individuals who worship the beast. These land dwellers. These are not the saints. There's a distinction here. It says, uh, uh, John details these peoples whose names are not written in the book of life. Jesus, that, that those who uh, have been slaughtered, if you read back in uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse uh, 8, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. All the land dwellers will worship him whose names has not, has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. According to the context, again, these people are associated with the land dwellers. These people are associated with those who are amazed and fall to the beast. These are the people here whose names are not written in the book of life are associated with those who celebrate the death of the two prophets. Simply put, these individuals are the people who gave themselves to Satan. They worship the beast. They worship the dragon. Period. This is not talking about this time, folks. This is talking about 
the tribulation, the great affliction, individuals who give themselves over to the beast, they have forfeited themselves. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, too, and kind of underscore this point. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone is killed with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. If anyone has an ear to hear, let him hear. This phrase speaks of the importance of the heavy consideration with what is said. This is so intense for the reader. Those who have an ear, listen. Ponder this for a second. Jesus uses this phrase concerning the kingdom of God to the Jews, to the Israelite people. He uses it all throughout uh, the Gospels. And even the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle John to the churches concerning Christ, as John is dictating, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the fellowships in that region, that this is important for you to consider that you need to lean in and weigh what has been said here. Don't skip over this. Right? If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. Uh, again, that word destined isn't there. That's, uh, clear, that's trying to bring clarity to the text. I just think, you know, if anyone for to captivity, to captivity he goes. If you are, uh, uh, if uh, the saint is imprisoned at this time, that's where they're going. If anyone kills with the sword, that's their death. Their, their life is done. They're extinguished. That there is no escaping this great affliction. It will be everywhere. Again, this, this is a contrast against those who are earth dwellers. You could think of these individuals who will do the bidding of the, of, of the beast, right? Those who worship him. He will, uh, uh, um, these individuals will try to overtake all the saints. Think of the two witnesses. Why do you think the two witnesses can uh, spit fire out of their mouth and basically singe people, burn them to a crisp, right? Is because... This period of time right here. Why do you think the, the prophets, the two witnesses, are able to not have, you know, uh, do the plagues as often as they wish? Because the environment is so hostile. They, they are seeking to destroy them. And this will be uh, all over the place. John wrote of the intensity and the hostility of this moment in history where this will be the greatest period of affliction the world has ever known. The saints will be imprisoned and with that harshly treated and the saints will be murdered during this time. I mean, there's persecution going on in our world, no doubt, but it will, be, it will pale in comparison to this. This is the reason why Daniel, in Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and following, writes this, At this time, Michael, the great prince who stands watch over your people, will rise up. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since the nations came into being until that time. But at that time, all your people who are found written in the book of life or written in the book will escape. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. This is during this time. Some to eternal life and some to shame and eternal contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the bright expanse of the heavens and those who will lead many to righteousness uh, like the stars forever and ever. I don't know if we'll do this one because I'm running out of time here. Yeah, this is, again, just underscoring Matthew and the fact that there will be a period of great distress, great times that has never occurred. Okay. We already took a look at that. So to sum up, 
we see the influence and the extent of the beast. That the influence and the extent of the beast comes by extension the dragon. And because of this, this fuels his hubris, his boastfulness, his arrogance, because no one, no one could thwart him. No one could take him. No one could conquer him. We see the source of the influence, as I just mentioned. The worship of unbelievers to the beast and by extension, the dragon. Once they fall and give themselves over to this beast, they give themselves over to the dragon. They give themselves over to Satan. The speech and prideful stance of this beast, the slander of this beast against the saints, against uh, 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 those who dwell in heaven against God himself and his reputation, the terrible affliction of the beast, that he will make war with the saints to destroy them, exterminate them and Israel. And again, the consequences and the consequence of those who follow the beast, that those who give themselves over to the beast they will not be found in the book of life. Until next week, we will continue our trek and our journey through Revelation chapter 13. Let's pray. What a chapter. What a chapter. So many details, so many things going on here. All, these, all of these moving parts. Lord, uh, we thank you, God, that we get to avoid this time, that this time is something that we, as uh, those who believe in Christ, what he did, who he is, what he accomplished, we get to skip this. But Lord, there are many, many, many individuals that will not skip this. We pray, God, that we would continue to be intentional about telling of your grace, this time of grace that is here, because one day um, it won't be here. We will be gone, and those who are left will have to deal with the carnage and the destruction um, of, of this particular period in time. But we thank you, God, that even during that time, you have not left any of humanity without hope, that uh, one can still know and have insight into what is happening at this time. We thank you so much, Lord, for giving us all things as it relates to your desire and your will. For it's in your son's name. Amen.